She lives. What do you mean, came back? She loves. I'm sorry, Arnie, I can't. She's a beauty. I know you're jealous. She's a beast. The kid was cut in half, Arnie. She's a killer. The riot is over. She's a 58 Fury. She's Christine. You ain't mad, are you? Christine. She's hell on wheels. Rated R. Coming soon to a theater near you. October continues on Reconsinimation. I'm John Diner. I'm David Munchak. I'm Brent Hutchins. And this is the podcast that takes a look back at some of our favorite films from our, from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And we are having, a, we had a special episode last time, but we are having a super special episode this time. Uh, of course, we, we look back at Nightmare on Elm Street 3 Dream Warriors with our, uh, with our pal E.K. Wimmer last week. Uh, but this week... We've got a, another special guest, and and one thing we're going to talk about is uh, horror scores, horror movie scores, and why they're so important to you know all of these horror films and making them what they are. Um, so welcome back to the show, Jay Blake Fischera from Scored to Death. All right, hey, good to see you, Blake. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate uh, you having me on. You know, it wasn't I can comp- till I got your email uh, yesterday, John. I had completely forgotten that I had come on here to talk about Rocky too. <laughs> Rocky, sure. I, just, I, guess, I guess I just talk about Rocky too in my private life so often that I just kind of mixed it all up. It's you all just one forget. gray you're, haze. You're always talking Rocky too, so it's easy to mix it up. <laughs> but yeah, we you were on for our werewolf episode, which you know we're probably the only podcast that talks about werewolf. And then, uh, yes. and then yeah. And then Rocky too. So dig those out of our archive at reconsideration.com. But tell everybody, let, let's hear what have you been up to? What's going on with Scored to Death? What's the latest? Well, uh, the latest of Scored to Death is I am currently trying to raise funds for Scored to Death, The Dark Art of Scary Movie Music, which is a documentary that uh, I've been saying is based on the books, but it's more of an extension of the books because... I don't want to just make like an abridged documentary of what the books were about. My plan is to kind of explore the art of scary movie music in a way that I just wasn't too, I wasn't able to in the, in the books, uh, the books score to death and score to death two were a collection of interviews with horror movie composers about their careers and their craft, how their processes working with directors. And we covered all the major American, uh, franchises plus in the second book we talked to japanese composers and the first book we talked to italian composers but uh you know and those were great but uh being a movie fan the plan was always to make a documentary so now uh that's what i'm trying to do now so i'm running a kickstarter campaign uh running now through november 1st 2022 and uh there's some really sweet tears for anybody who wants to uh pledge the one I'm most excited about is I've I've assembled a dream team of uh, musicians and and composers to put together a an album of horror movie covers, horror movie Whoa. theme covers. Whoa, that's uh, rad, dude. So we're releasing a limited edition vinyl and CD of uh, covers of horror movie themes uh, with people like Alan Howarth, who I'm sure we'll talk about tonight. Uh, Steve Moore from the band Zombie, the band Voyager, Anima Morte is also a great band, uh, Holly Amber Church, who's a great composer, the Blair Brothers, who are great composers, uh, Wojciech Golczewski, who's a, an amazing composer from uh, Poland, who I interviewed on Score to Death Radio way back a couple of years ago when we first started. Uh, just a, a really great group. Richard Christie who people know from the Howard Stern show, but yep. uh, he's also like a legendary heavy metal drummer and he's a friend of mine. So he's, he's doing a track. And uh, so we're going to put together this. It's it, the Kickstarter campaign is really kind of like a two for one. You have, you have the ability to get this really cool limited edition album. And all these people are recording new versions of these things. That's they're all 
going to be specifically for this album. Uh, so they're lending their talents for free <laughs> to kind of help raise money for the film because they're excited about it and uh, they're awesome. Uh, film composers are awesome in general. And uh, this is kind of uh, proof of it. I just kind of started emailing people I liked and I said, I'm trying to do this. Would you want to participate? And they said, sure. And uh, so right now through November 1st, uh, check out Kickstarter, Score to Death, the dark art of scary movie music. You can follow me on social media at Score to Death, or you can just join the mailing list at score to death.com. Yeah, man, that, that sounds awesome. Yeah, I, uh, that's an let's get those pledges in. <laughs> like I missed uh, all of that. Can you can you do that again? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that sounds amazing, though. No, oh, that sounds like an amazing project. Yeah, yeah, well, I not knowing how much money the something like this could raise on uh, you know crowdfunding, I, I was hesitant to promise like a soundtrack. Um, cause I didn't know if I could hire, if I was going to raise enough money to hire a composer to do so like an original score for it. And, but being a documentary about horror film music and there being such a big collector's base, including myself, I'm, I count myself among these people who collect things like vinyl and the music. I, I wanted to offer something that would be really cool for those people that would be looking for yeah. something tangible that they could hold and that would be music related for their collection. And so I came up with this idea and I'm actually kind of more excited about the album than I am <laughs> <laughs> the, the movie, but uh, the, here's the tough thing. You know, if we can't raise the money on Kickstarter, uh, if we don't reach our goal, we don't get to keep any money. So that means if I, we don't reach right. our measly goal of forty thousand dollars to for this, then uh, we're not oh. going to get a movie or an album. So oh, it's, no. a, it's important that uh, well, we got to get everybody involved. Yeah, we yeah. we got to help you get there for sure. And right. so people can cinemites, get... let's make it happen. <laughs> Come on, you you cinema shrieking cinemaniacs. <laughs> <laughs> and if people can't contribute, that's great. Uh, just even spreading the word and letting yeah. other people know that it exists is just as important. The, the retweeting and the sharing, like everybody listening, just just go over to it, you know, share it. Even if you're not going to, you know, like Blake is saying, if you're not going to donate money, at least just retweet it and spread the word. Yeah. So if you're on Kickstarter, you can't remember that whole time. Just score to death. Score to death will take you. You'll find the live project. But score to death, the dark art of scary movie music. And the project's live now in 2022 through November 1st, you said, right? Yes. Beautiful. Let's go. Let's let's get those numbers up. It's such yeah, a it's such it a happen. fresh angle, too. I mean, like yeah. really, there's no other. I mean, there's I, I haven't seen really any other books besides yours and you know, and like this documentary. Like there's there's really nothing about film composing and the music side of horror films so it's it's really awesome i think it's really important to uh get the word out there yeah and it's it's fascinating i, I wouldn't have been keep i wouldn't keep doing it if i didn't <laughs> end, find it yeah. endlessly fascinating oh so you're into this you like it. <laughs> yeah so this is like a thing you do <laughs> oh that's cool you're interested in this that's neat <laughs> it's like a hobby <laughs> well we love awesome. uh our horror scores as well. And one of our favorite, uh, you know, composing teams, I guess you'd say is, is John Carpenter and Alan Howarth. And, yeah. and what we're talking about today, why we're all convening uh, is about the 1983 film, Christine. Hey, Hey, we're well, back. Daddy. We're talking Carpenter. We're back to Carpenter. We're all, Carpenter. all the way back. We've been, I think, we've hit, I think we've hit everything. No, I think the only thing we haven't done is Dark Star and Elvis at this point. All the body way up. bags. Well, when we're not body... there. We're going. We're kind of going in order. So. Gotcha. Okay. okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'll slow down. I'll slow down. I'm getting ahead. Of <laughs> Don't get too excited. Body bags will, is down the road. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, Christine, uh, David, do do your usual quick plot summary for those that maybe uh, haven't seen Christine in a while. Kind of maybe they forgot what it's about. What's happening, Christine? Well, Christine is, it, it is a dark story about a young man who finds himself under the influence of a, uh, a decades old car who that seems to kind of uh, seduce him in a way that affects his relationships with uh, the people that, uh, and his, his relationships and his 
um, uh, uh, growth as a human being from a nerd to a dark, uh, a dark kind of bully kind of villain, and uh, and then how that affects his relationships with family, friends, and uh, this this demonic this demonic vehicle. So um, that's the exploration of that film. So it's the the John Carpenter film based on the Stephen King novel. Correct. Um, when Blake, when when was the first time you saw Christine? Did you you didn't obviously we're we're a little young for it when uh, it was in theaters, but you catch it on home video. Where where did you see it for the first time? I caught it really early on home video. Uh, my parents were divorced, uh, and I didn't have cable or VCR at my mom's house. But when I would visit my dad, he had a VCR and cable, and I remember we at that point it was so early that we'd go to Rite Aid and rent movies. Nice. And I remember we went, we, we rented Christine and uh, the opening scene where the hood comes down and kind of mangles the guy's hand. And then the guy dies in the car scared me so much that I got up and I walked out of the room and I just have this recollection of my dad and my older brother, like kneeling down and being like, the car is like Kit from Knight Rider. It's okay. <laughs> oh, <hold on. laughs> trying to yeah. talk me. Into, oh no! Just like it. <laughs> just like Kit. That's even worse. <laughs> and, and talking me into uh, to watching it. But I, I also uh, I've never I've never actually read the book, but I do remember my mom had like a hard copy of the book, like in her bedroom, for a lot of my youth. And I think it was given to her for my friend. And I was so young. I, I, I should have called her and asked her about this uh, before, uh, you know, before the show. But I recall that I think she was given to her by a friend because my mom had a car named Penny that she was convinced was haunted. And she oh, got in a horrible car accident ooh, in that oh, car no. when Yikes. I was little. Oh, wow. And so uh, Christine has always had a very uh, <laughs> weird place in my psyche. <laughs> <laughs> haunting haunting <laughs> Brent Brensky what about you when did you first see Christine boy uh it would have been I, I think it was on tv like I think it was a tv broadcast of it but it was pretty early on I mean this is similar uh to you Blake my mom had uh the hard copy of this book but she had the hard copy of just about every Stephen King book uh that I can remember from my youth she was a huge fan so we watched, um, I mean, even prior to this, we, wa- we would watch Salem's Lot together, you know, so like when this and Cujo came out and those movies were coming around, like they were around. I don't think we rented them on VHS because they were R-rated and I don't, I still would have been, you know, six, seven when, when this was happening. So I don't, I don't think I would have been, uh, they'd have been rentals that i was watching with her but i think on tv we watched it and it was pretty early on like whenever they first hit tv uh you know we were watching them for sure nice david uh what did when let me guess first time view for christine for the show no i saw it when i was like 12 or 13 all right my brothers had rented it and uh uh yeah the we it was definitely a rental we were all watching it and uh i was I was uh, intrigued to see my the hero of Back to School and, and Jaws two yeah. turn it have a villainous turn. I was like, "How? What is he bad? He's like a bad guy. He's like a that was me too." <laughs> you know, I was like, "No, oh, I don't want to see him being evil." You know, um, but uh, no, he did a good uh, Kevin Kevin Gordon. Am I saying that Keith, right? Keith Keith Gordon? Keith Gordon. Keith, Keith, Keith yeah. Gordon. Uh, did a you know, it was it's was, it was another Keith Gordon movie that was probably like the last thing I'd seen him in. I know mean, he didn't do a ton before he switched over to directing, but yeah, um, that was probably the last thing I had seen him in. So, you know, I'd seen a bunch of his other stuff, yeah. a few of his other things. Yeah, I um, I didn't see this movie till I think I was deep into high school, so maybe ninety six, ninety seven was the first time I actually saw it. Mm-hmm. But I was always, you know, as a kid, like a lot of us, even if we hadn't read the books, I think we were, there was always a fascination about Stephen King because he was just, he was everywhere. He was so popular, you know, as a novelist and then as his, as books were being made into movies. And I I was a big fan 
I mean, it scared the hell out of me, but it, you know, the 1990 version. Yeah. Absolutely scared the hell out of me. I had the book of it. I read like maybe the first couple chapters and was too scared to keep going. It was the cover that had like the eyes that like follow you as you, as wherever you go. Oh, I still have it, but, uh, uh, but I didn't see Christine till later on. And I remember buying it, Christine and cat's eye. I was like, just going down the Stephen King road and I bought yeah, both of them together. Eye. Yeah. But I was like, Oh my God, it's, it's the, it's Cougar from top gun. It's the guy from back to school and jaws Two, And, and one of the, at the time, Alexandra Paul was on Baywatch. So all, right. all the stars are here. <laughs> all the stars. <laughs> But yeah, I and and really like I, when I first saw it, I I didn't even I hadn't become a Carpenter fan at that time. Or there were movies of his that I liked, but I didn't really like put them all together. So it didn't click that like oh this is part of the Carpenter thing. Uh, right later I, on that that caught up with me. But yeah, yeah, this was much more a Stephen King thing than it was a Carpenter thing for for me and my family when this was when this was coming out. Right. I mean, this was this was a huge time for for Stephen King. Like this was right before. I mean, basically right after 83 is when he became just an absolute household name, like, you know, a bankable, uh, you know, uh, talent on on not only books, but also in, in movies. I mean, you, you look at the posters post post 83 and his name's kind of all over it, you know, yeah. even even during 83. But. But I mean, the movies that he had leading up to this were all pretty uh, widely recognized and successful, you know, with Carrie and The Shining and even Creep Show, and you know, so yeah, this was this was this was a good year. Yeah, that's right. Like this was right around the time that he was just exploding. I mean, 1983 movies wise, we had Cujo, Christine, and The Dead Zone all released in one year. Right. I mean, and then don't don't forget 1985, we get his best film, which is Silver Bullet. We all know that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Which is the only which I I was surprised to find. I went back, you know, I've not always been on the podcast with you guys. And I went back to look at the old catalog and Silver Bullet's the only movie you guys have covered that is Stephen King, right? That is that is correct. This is mm-hmm. uh, this is only number two here. Yeah, it's bananas for me to think about that. Just considering how big a influence he was in, you know, not in film and literature yeah. throughout the '80s. Uh, but I'm, I'm stoked we're doing Christine today. Yeah, Blake, where where are you on the Stephen King uh, scale? I think I know where you are on Carpenter. We'll talk about him in a sec. But uh, how are you with Stephen King? Are you you a big fan, or what do you think? Uh, I mean, I'm not a huge, uh, like narrative, like fiction reader. When I read, it's more like nonfiction stuff. So I think maybe the only thing I've read of his all the way through is the mist. Oh, really? Wow. And, um, and I guess, uh, the one that the, the, the novella, which was originally like a calendar that was that that uh silver bullet was based on i forget what it's called the cycle of the werewolf yeah cycle of the werewolf yeah because uh i at some point when i started collecting the novelizations about 10 years ago i ended up finding this really cool silver bullet um book that was cycle of the werewolf and then his original script for silver bullet wow oh that's cool that's awesome which is really kind of interesting to, to read how does it um, differ how does it differ from the from the version that was filmed uh, i just remember like that the, the werewolf is more if i recall correctly especially like in the opening scene he's, he's like more like he talks and stuff if i mm. if i recall like i guess like you know during the earlier parts of the cycle Okay, um, I'm just a werewolf. What's going on? Hey, come on, guys. Hi, this is crazy. I'm just hairy like, and hungry. It's kind of like T Wolf at that point. Yeah, <laughs> got it. Uh, 
but okay. uh, so so movie wise look you know i, I grew up uh, i was born in the late 70s i grew up through the 80s into the 90s and so movie wise like his stuff was huge you know uh, yeah. not all good but yeah uh but huge uh I, you know Cujo it was great I still love Cujo to this day Christine like I said was kind of a big movie for me because of very odd circumstances but I always had a kind of a special place in my heart because of that uh I didn't discover the dead zone until later on when I started to get into to Cronenberg in the mm-hmm. late 90s but um you know I remember Firestarter and yeah. Cat's Eye and Creepshow and- Cat's Eye has just one of the best uh theme songs out there <laughs> a very odd, a very odd score for Alan Silvestri. Yeah, Mr. Uh, Back oh. to the Future. Yeah, doing, uh, the Simpsons one. Um, and then in the '90s, you know, it was kind of that resurgence with it. But then into the late '90s with like Dreamcatcher and of course yeah. Shawshank Shank and all that stuff. So yeah. well, they started getting into toward towards the end of the '90s into the 2000s. It was like getting into his library that I, I wasn't familiar with anymore. It wasn't stuff that we grew up with, you know, some of the titles that, you know, his, his more recent titles are just turning right into movies that I think right. just didn't, weren't uh, nearly as captivating as his earlier body of work. And now we're just, now we have remakes. So we'll get, I mean, but there's there. still, there's still new stuff that he's doing. I mean, if you look yeah. at like Dr. Sleep, which is this, you know, he wrote the novel for that, but mm-hmm. there's the, the movie on there, but it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree. Like in that kind of late nineties, early two thousands time, like he kind of fell off. I'm curious to see if like younger audiences today uh, know or understand or are as familiar with like his influence and, and what he's done, because I mean, you know, you mentioned Shawshank, but you know, like he's obviously, you know, the stand by me and running mm-hmm. man, like there's, there's a ton of horror things like scary movies that have been, you know, um, that, that have come from his novels, but then also just a ton of kind of things that you wouldn't associate with him that are, that are huge recognizable, you know, movies, green mile. I don't know if I mentioned that one, but you know, I mean, and so, yeah, it's interesting. I don't know. I, because I don't feel like he gets as much, I don't think he's as pop culturally recognizable these days as he was when we were younger, but I, I could be totally wrong. Well, I, I mean, think with, with the newer, you know, the two it films being as popular as they were. And I think he's got, you know, he's other things, Dr. Sleep and, and Castle Rock coming out. Like his name is out there. Yeah, but on the it posters, like he's not like he's not really, you know, that's what I was saying. Like it, in the eighties, like you would see a Stephen King or a, a movie that was written by the book was written by a Stephen King, like that would have been plastered large and like mm-hmm. in your face. And I feel like the new it uh, movie, like it was, you know, it's I don't think it's featured on there. Yeah. You know, the, the it posters were like, it's like Stranger Things. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Not- right. We even got some of the cast, you know, and it's like, yeah, it, which it is, wasn't which, which Stranger Things is so influenced by him as well. So, yeah, yeah it's funny. It's, yeah, funny. Yeah. it's all indirect. It's like without yeah. saying his name, it's all kind of pointing at him. Yeah. And like, and like yeah, you he, said, there's a ton of remakes that they're making of his stuff now, too. Like it's bananas. So, yeah, you know, he's less the he's less the draw for people like for the younger like they're not marketing toward the people that would recognize his name you know yeah not and which is like i guess like i guess at a certain point he's just oh he's that old that old guy that wrote books like i don't know like he, i don't know like he should be synonymous with horror being a horror master so why would you still not plaster his name all over yeah every bit yeah. but i guess that's still like a generational like uh turn off I mean, I don't know. These yeah. marketers, they're they're the brilliant people that know what they're doing. Um, they're, they're never yeah. wrong. So I'm gonna definitely, you know, defer to their choices in terms <laughs> of how do you get a how do you get a four quadrant audience to uh, Christine? Uh, the remake that they'll make in 2025 and uh, <laughs> it'll be animated. Yeah. I know, kind of surprising it hasn't already happened, but <laughs> yeah. I guess his books. I guess his books lately, or his later books as well, are not as consistently like recognize or talk about uh, like yeah. like occasionally yeah. you'll you'll hear of one where it's like oh Stephen King finally hit it out of the park again but then 
he's got like two or three books that come out each year. And I don't know that each one is one that is like getting a lot of recognition. Yeah. Although I hear that his latest fairy tale is supposed to be really, really good. I, I couldn't tell you the the last like new Stephen King book that I knew. I knew right off the top of my head what the title was. Right. I think the last one that got most of the recognition was the one about the JFK assassination, right? The, oh, 1860, 1963? Not, not I, I think it's 1122. 11, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, 11, 22, 11 20, that's, the, that's right. Yeah. That's yeah. the only Stephen King book I've ever read. Is it? So, yeah. Some people, that's, yeah, you know, you're, I, I've up. heard that from other people. Throw a time travel element. Yeah, I'll watch. Yeah, I'll read that. <laughs> no problem. He, keep an ear out. Keep an ear out for Fairy Tale. It's his latest, which, which, like I said, I hear is supposed to be like really like one of his, one of his best in a long time. Yeah, yeah. people are I digging have, that. I, I, was thinking of, I was thinking of picking that up. Yeah. Now he doesn't always. Obviously, he has his own opinions on uh, some of the films that were made, and famously, he like despises The Shining, right? Yeah, yeah. Which not, always baffled me. Like, I mean, I get, I get that. You know, it's Stanley Kubrick's vision of that story, right? But right. it's incredible. Right. <laughs> like, um, and when well, we they saw they made a remake, right? Well, that uh, he like directed. Didn't series, didn't yeah. he direct that? Yeah. A miniseries, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think it was Mick, Mick, Mick Garris might have directed. Oh, that. Mick Garris, yeah, yeah. But he, yeah. but he was much more hands on, and it was his, yeah. you know, right. it was it was the more true translation of his novel. Which I don't know. I mean, how do you guys feel about that? I I think that was uh, just nowhere anywhere in the same stratosphere as uh, I didn't even as, see it. As the I movie. watched it. I watched all two or three parts. You're a Steven I, I, Weber fan. That's why. I was a Weber and De Mornay fan. Yes. So Steven um, Weber went to SUNY Purchase. Yes. I, like yeah. <laughs> I love Wings, right? Steven, Steven Weber's, Weber's great, actually. Yeah. Steven Weber's wonderful. And yeah. I, yeah. like, I'm not cutting on any other cast. Like, so I don't know. I mean, it's, it, I happen to happen to be like I'll check it out and so I watch the first part and then okay yeah I'm finishing this. I don't know. They're different stories. They're not the mm-hmm. same they're not the same tale. So yeah. It's like they're very different. <laughs> like so and if it's like okay that that's what the book is. I mean I think I, I have not having not read the book I'm like well this is pretty solid. Like this would be this would be fun to read and use your imagination about, you know. Mm-hmm. Um where you know Kubrick's is a completely different you know, it's just a different take. It just yeah. doesn't make, make sense. I, I but yeah. I like, I, but, and the thing is like, how do you, uh, the problem with like these Stephen King things, like a two hour movie doesn't necessarily do it justice. You need these mini series. You need, well, for you need, well, what's the average uh, length of one of his books? It's like what, 600 pages. Yeah. 600 yeah. pages. So, so that's why like, it's a mini series. Sometimes they come the back stand. and yeah. the, Although land, the stands stand. a TV series now too. Yeah. Langoliers, Langoliers. Um, Don't you dare forget that one. Um, and I hadn't read all of. I had again. I haven't read any of his stuff other than the, the that recent book. But you know, I was watching a bunch of his miniseries and a few of his films. A few of the films. So I hadn't seen The Stand though for years after. <laughs> I don't know. I think I saw The Stand in two thousand and five. <laughs> or not? Wow. Excuse me. Not the Stand. <laughs> not the Stand. Excuse me. Um, uh, 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 the Shining. So the original Shining, or the Kubrick Shining, I didn't see until like 2005. So, um, oh. which is much different than. So you, so you saw the the TV the, Stephen King's the the TV version, yeah. first. Yeah. Oh wow, interesting. Yeah. I kind of like well, that, that more. <laughs> yeah, that's that's in, that's fascinating. Yeah, I just yeah, remember I, the kid being really annoying in the miniseries. Yes. <laughs> yeah, he was. Annoying. That was my big takeaway because I think I want to say that came out when I was in college, so it was kind of a. It was. A re- yeah, yeah, it was, it was like, like mid late nineties or something. Yeah, or maybe 96. it was just before I left for college, but I just remember like I just found the kid really annoying. He did um, a pizza but- commercial after that. He was fine. He's fine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I mean, what you're talking about with like Kubrick, I mean, that's kind of all these things with like trying to you know make a movie out of, of a, out of a book in general is, is kind of like a big feat and to make something right. out of stevie king is like you said i mean they're long and then especially back in the earliest of his movies they were all made by like pretty yeah I mean, touristic mm-hmm. filmmakers so i mean there was really no way 
for them not to be like a hybrid uh, right. and not be genuine, like totally genuine to the source material. Because we're, we're, you know, we're talking about like Brian De Palma, mm-hmm. Stanley Kubrick, John Carpenter, uh, uh, David Cronenberg. I mean, do you get yeah, yeah, more yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. specific filmmakers than these guys? Romero, right? Yeah. Romero with Creep yeah. Show. Yeah. I'm not I mean, an expert. Shit. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say even, I mean, Salem's Lot, you know, like had Toby Hooper as one of the, yeah, one of the contributing writers on it. So, I mean, you know, not directly. He directed but he, it too. Yeah. Did he? Uh, I couldn't confirm that. Did he end up directing it? I thought I he believe did. He, I believe I think, he did. Romero, I think, initially, originally Romero, Romero was going to direct it. And then it's just like, it didn't happen. And then they ended up doing Creep Show together later. But I'm pretty sure that the first one is directed by Hooper and the Maybe sequel, the, I think, is directed by Larry Cohen, if I'm not mistaken. Mm. Of wait, of of Salem's Lot. S- Salem's Lot, yeah. So I thought Toby Hooper had done it, but he only gets a screenplay credit, and Paul Monash gets the director credit on the on the poster that I found of it. But huh, interesting. But I always thought Toby Hooper did direct it, but I I'm not. Maybe he directed one part because it was a two yeah. part miniseries, so I'm not yeah. sure. Have anyway, to get the interns on that one. Yeah, yeah, we have to <laughs> definitely get the interns on that one. I'm, I'm, I'm getting word right now. Monash wrote the script. Uh, Toby Hooper did direct it. Is that right? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Our well, interns go. are going to have to battle it out and see what re- really <laughs> happened. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, those are all like big name directors of the late '70s and early '80s, and and of course we're all big John Carpenter fans. So it's, it's interesting to see the mix of those two worlds. And, you know, like, like we we're saying about Kubrick, you know, didn't mix well with King. How does Carpenter do it? Let's, let's uh, see. So Carpenter is coming off of the thing, which, which we covered a few months back and is currently my number one all-time favorite movie it's just gone up and up over the years love it i think it's perfect i love everything about it but uh, amazingly enough uh there was another alien that came out that year that uh dominated uh what what the thing uh, should have been doing at the box office and and it's was considered a massive failure at the time right yeah the thing that thing yeah. almost ruined oh, his career yeah. The yeah. Thing, yeah that was i thought I mean, about the other alien he had he had massive hit with Halloween, obviously that made his career. Uh, but even Escape from New York, The Fog, not massive hits that Halloween was, but they were definitely made money and they were considered successes. But then turning into the thing that you know a lot more went into it. I think expectations were pretty high for it, and it just you know it didn't uh, didn't happen then. Although it would certainly have legs, uh, you know, over the course of time. Yeah, but yeah that almost killed his whole career, right? Yeah, I mean, he he only basically took Christine because he was afraid that if he didn't take that, he wasn't going to get offered another job. Well, I, I, I mean, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say it. You know, it's you know he's blamed it on ET, uh, the success of ET, and I I don't totally buy that, but uh, I will say that I give a lot of credit to him, not just for making an amazing movie and the thing, but. I just can't imagine being a person and like sitting in the edit room and like watching that movie come together and watching the cut of it and not just being totally crushed by the reaction of it, like being called a pornographer of gore and, you know, being yeah. called like all these awful things in the press. And basically he lost Firestarter. He was going to direct Firestarter. And to this day, he says that script was one of the best scripts he ever read. I don't know why they didn't use that script for mm. Maybe it went from Universal to Dino De Laurentiis and they couldn't use the same script. That mm-hmm. I don't know. But he basically lost Firestarter because of the failure of the thing. And uh, he ends up taking Christine because he's afraid that he's not going to get offered anything else. And then he ends up doing Starman because basically like his management or his agent is like, you got to do something nice that people yeah. are going <laughs> to like. If you, would. you need to make a nice alien movie. You need yeah. to make like a romantic movie. Uh, which Starman is one of my favorite movies of his, but uh, yeah, I mean, it took, it, it was a blow that uh, I, I just totally, I think derailed his career and then big trouble in little China failed too. Yeah. Um, 
so he had he had a he had a rough rough patch in there, in there well, in the and, 80s. and that was really big trouble in little china's failure coming you know not too long after the thing's failure was really the end of his really working for working in the major studio system right like after that he just he lost faith in the whole the pol you know the politics of the studio system and just really didn't want to play the game yeah he just wanted to make a low budget movie that he could have total control on and then he makes arguably his weirdest movie prince of darkness yeah <laughs> <laughs> which i love but it's it is really like uh you know i i love it but it i can see why not everybody does i mean yeah. it's very strange and it's very out there but christine is you know when you look at all of this stuff you know obviously some of them fall more into like the carpenter structure but it's all there i mean even christine as we talk about it you know like we'll see that has so much in common with things like halloween and <laughs> and he really does and, yeah and some of his other movies um he doesn't like it but i've always i've always loved it and it's only grown uh even more in my uh my order of john carpenter movies um, john carpenter is my favorite filmmaker so i'm like i've been totally obsessed with his movies since i saw in the mouth of madness in the mid 90s like you john like you were describing when i saw in the mouth of madness and then i started to research what other movies he did in a pre-internet <laughs> world how, how did we uh, find anything out then <laughs> my like, I, I, like was, I was way, <laughs> i was way into the microfilm and microfiche at the yeah. library like reading through magazines and um but then i started to realize that this guy directed all these movies that were either like just i had huge memories of like christine or that I loved, like Big Trouble in Little China, and by that point they live. And I had seen Prince of Darkness with my friends, and the thing I remember watching like really, really early when I was a kid. And and I just realized like this guy's been one of my favorite filmmakers my whole life, and yeah. I kind of didn't know it until now. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah, I had I, the same thing. Like I had loved loved Halloween. I loved Big Trouble in Little China was the first Carpenter movie that I saw, and I saw it in the theater. So I contributed. I paid my whatever it was three dollars at the time right. uh but i you know that was one of has always been one of my favorite movies and then yeah saw the thing love that saw halloween love that and then one by one I'm realizing like escape from new york seeing all these movies that are some of my favorites and oh yeah the same same guy directed all of them but didn't put that together till probably like my senior year of high school when i really really got in a film when I was watching Christine again, um, I also have a very special uh, connection to Christine and that the day that the movie opens in present day, September 12th, 1978, is my birthday. So I always, it's my birthday movie. So I always watch it. I watch <laughs> it every awesome. year. That's awesome. Is September that the day you were born? Or yeah, the exact, day, the same year. and uh, Same year and day? Wow, holy same shit. Same year and day. So, and uh, and Arnie's social security number is also mine, which is 273. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh. He, so he was, yeah, he was working on Firestarter. So this this marriage with Stephen King was was apparently destiny. You know, it, it's it's a huge job translating Stephen King's novels into, mm. into you know, taking a 600-page novel down to a what 110 page script that they ended up with and you know it's tight like they're really i think the script flows i think I, I don't think it just feels like it's kind of seamless christine that that everything you know works there's really nothing that feels like it's out of place i think from what from what i you know i haven't read the novel i i have it as well i haven't read it though uh you know, from everything I hear, it seems like they got all the major points from the novel into the film with some changes, which I think were probably for the better. Um, one of the big ones being the well, we never really in, in the movie. Do we ever get it answered why the car is possessed? No, no, it's just possessed from the beginning. Like right, it, it, it just it is that way. Crushes that guy's hand, and that's supposed to be our signal that this car is not right. In it's the engine taste for blood, and then that's it. 
<laughs> oh, I remember what I was going to say before. Oh, real quick. Uh, before we shoot, go for it. I was going to say when I was watching it this time around, I, I it dawned on me that, you know, our generation saw all these movies, not just on VHS, but in like, you know, cropped pan and scan. scan. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. For the three. best. The best. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Carpenter's movies are so wide and uh, glorious that I was like, I really reveled in it this time to be like, oh yeah, like, you know, the first time I saw mo- almost all of that, all of his movies up until I think the first movie I remember s- seeing of his in the theater was like vampires. So like every John Carpenter mm, which... movie I'd seen and, and grew up with was, you know, cropped and, uh, but they still, they were still awesome. Vampires that was shot uh, right, you know, in and around our college in Santa Fe. That's right. Santa I saw Fe, vampires. Yeah. I saw that in the theater. Look at that, David. You, you yeah, seen Padre, it? fuck with him. I love my favorite one. <laughs> 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 love that shit. Sorry. Well, yeah, well I think I think watching Christine this time had to have been the first time I saw it, you know, widescreen. Because hmm. I hadn't seen it in so long. And yeah, yeah I, I don't miss the... Uh, pan and scan you know option that uh we were all forced into really for so long yeah like when i was I'm at suncoast yeah when i worked at suncoast i had the you know the display of what the difference is it you know between a pan and scan and a widescreen and it was always the abyss it was always like an image from the abyss with the you know oh, what yeah. the uh cgi like water creature and it was like explain to people like you're missing like half the image by oh yeah but no this. no 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 that everybody thought they were missing half the image with the with the letterbox right. that was yeah. always the thing like yeah. when i was working at video impact they'd be like i don't want letterbox they, they cut out they cut but out half do. the image i'm like no 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 that's you do not want right <laughs> yeah yeah but um Sorry, i didn't mean to do derail I no all good that's what we're here so, for so in the novel how so the 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 actual like there's like a ghost in the car like the person who is possessing the car is like present in the car right Ooh. I, th- I think that's yeah. what it yeah that's the word yeah the previous owner is a ghost in the car and uh, by right. in 1983 uh american werewolf of london had come out and they felt like griffin dunn's character was kind of too reminiscent and kind of doing the same thing and they didn't want to be like blamed for you know kind of ripping off america world for yeah. and so they've decided to cut out that character altogether but i've heard in recent interviews with carpenter he's talked about how like you know maybe that was a bad choice and they should have they should have kept it it's I weird because you hear something like that and that's obviously such a huge change but then you often hear that like it's it's very accurate you know it's very faithful to the book but it's like i don't know it seems like it's not if they're, <laughs> if they're cutting if they're cutting out something that big yeah it's it's LeBay's brother that is the one that's possessing it right i think no. so yeah right LeBay's LeBay's brother is the guy that sells him oh that's yeah. right yeah it depends on which LeBay you're talking about yeah yeah, yeah. so <laughs> LeBay the, the living LeBay which is, is robert's blossom right in the movie yeah yeah, yeah. yes but but I thought I read that it was his brother in, in the book. I thought I read that it was his brother that was the one that died and yeah. possessed the car. Yeah, it's the it's the previous owner before Arnie. Right. Okay. So, so it doesn't the, have so that. the guy in this in the movie story that that has killed himself in the car. Yeah. Yeah. So the book doesn't have like the 1957, you know, m- murder and, and mauling of people. Like, well, I don't. I that's the thing is because none of this is where I have going on this rabbit hole where like we haven't read the book. <laughs> we haven't read the book. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if it, I don't know if it's that Christine wasn't also haunted, like that he's right. the haunting, or it's just there's just she's evil and he's also in the car. The world wasn't ready for a a ghost possessing a car, I guess, for the for film, and uh, they they eschewed that for just evil car there are people <laughs> that love the book that are like you assholes uh, <laughs> we wouldn't ha- we totally. wouldn't have anything good like that until child's play right we're having a there you a, go a person that, possessing a doll right not too far down the road yep 
I don't know. I don't know if it would have worked if they, uh, you know, I'm just trying to think if they had an actor, you know, in the backseat in whatever kind of makeup, I just I feel <laughs> like it's going to come off like really cheesy. Like, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's how they would have played it. too. <laughs> that's exactly how it would yeah. have been done. An actor would have been, been a carpenter would have had vinyl. no idea what to do. He, he looks wouldn't like have the known. vinyl seats. <laughs> Whatever. But I feel like it's Buster. Uh, what's uh, Buster Poindexter all of a sudden? Like, I'm just like, <laughs> yeah. why is why do I have a visual of him? <laughs> I, I would like to see oh, that. My God. I kind of like uh, the, the thing. And I've said this before. And I again, as someone who doesn't read King. And then has only seen X amount of his translated media into TV, miniseries, or film. Um, that there's like there there's a, a lot of the things that are popular is like there is just an omnipresent evil that is unstoppable that will like you don't have a choice like this evil will take over this evil is uh, oppressive and you can't stop it and it even occurs in his his, his dumb JFK book where like you know the 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 timeline gets changed and then everything is screwed up and not and not just like the world is screwed up like an oppressive like sort of demonic force has changed the has changed the world and no one can live and it's like it seems like the same thing of like whether it's the langoliers or like christine being possessed or just like i saw most of pet cemetery which i think it's, it's just sort of like this is just the thing that happens there's evil it you know the stand it's like there's yeah, it's just unexplained evil. there's yeah. a lot of unexplained and there's nothing you can do as a an innocent person you either succumb to it or you fight against it and die <laughs> like and it's kind of like it's the horror version of what they do with fargo which is like well people just get into like some weird scrapes and then just end up committing terrible acts to survive and uh but there's no horror element or a supernatural element and uh i I always found it a little like off-putting for me is like i feel like you should always have a choice to like fight i feel like in the in fiction like you should have a you have to be able to fight this thing you can't just always succumb so part of it is like i'm not i'm not a huge fan of like a lot of that translated media like the shining same thing like in kubrick's version of the shining like why does jack become that you can't explain it like it's just a crazy and and even still, even in the miniseries, the same thing happens. But there is a re- there is a slight redemption for Jack by the end. Um, so it, I'm not sure what it is. Like I think it's like there. I'm not sure what King's mission statement is in terms of like good and evil and innocence and 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 being bad or whatever. And there's certainly a delineation between being a child. And someone who has had sex, which is apparently like that shows up in a lot of like these things. It's yeah. I don't know. Like sex is always a thing. Sex there's is always like, there's some weird sex stuff going on in, in his always. books and more in his books than movies, but yeah. <laughs> which whatever. Uh so yeah, anyway, I'm just like sort of like I'm not sure how to like and not having seen all of his film all of the translated films, and certainly not ever reading the, any of the books, like is that I don't know. Does anyone have any insight into like is that how it is? Like, is that just how King well, it, it's, it's, it? it's, yeah, it's unexplained um, for the most part. And, and that actually goes for Carpenter as well, because they're like, we were saying earlier that there's that parallel between Halloween and Christine, but mm-hmm. kind of all of really, you know, all of, uh, of Carpenter's horror stuff, there's really no genesis for what the evil is i mean maybe the thing it's an alien yeah and the fog but i mean there's a lot of parallels with uh christine and his other stuff i mean specifically halloween i mean they both take place in 78 uh they they shot it both the neighborhoods are are south pasadena so it looks like right around the corner from me (laughs) (laughs) and uh but like michael myers is just pure evil that's it that's the explanation Faceless. same with christine she she just came off the assembly in that line that way um they're just kind of like the embodiment of evil also like a running theme in his his movies is like evil kind of like from the past you know in, in, mm-hmm. with christine it's that she's built in the in the late 50s and now it's 20 years later but meyer michael myers and halloween has been 
in an institution for like 15 years or whatever. And the thing has been buried on, in the ice for who knows how long. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the fog, the, the dead sailors mm-hmm. have been dormant and mm-hmm. Prince of Darkness, years, right? <laughs> wasn't like a hundred years in the fog. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. And yep. in Prince of Darkness, it's like that thing's been in the ooze for, you know, millions and millions of years. In the huh. mouth of madness, they've been, you know, it's a, that's a kind of like an ongoing thing for him. But yeah. Chris, but Christine, just like watching Christine and Halloween, they just like there's just they're both high school stories. Mm-hmm. They both have like an like an, a car scene between like two best friends talking about like they need to get a companion. Obviously, yeah. the boys talk about it in a much crueler way than Lori. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <Crass. laughs> yeah. this is shocking. <laughs> with her friends but i always joke around that you know obviously halloween's supposed to be illinois but but since it's like shot around the basically in the same neighborhood i always be like man 1978 was a rough year for that neighborhood <laughs> <laughs> tough for the boys a lot of tough shit for the boys a lot of boys they're not getting laid and lots of murder and death and there's a lot there. of michael myers shows back up around <laughs> halloween in between a lot of right in the middle of this movie <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, the the high school element too. You're right. Is is such a such a parallel, and but uh, you know, so Arnie is really the relationship between Arnie and Dennis w- was interesting because Arnie is you know your typical quote unquote nerd and outsider uh, who really doesn't have any friends besides Dennis, right? But but Dennis is like Dennis is like the jock, like he like it's it's interesting to see that like would they really be friends at this point in their lives yeah no you can tell like they grew up together from the yeah, like right. they don't have to say it in the script like right sure they've been friends since first grade and dennis yeah. became a jock yeah and 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 arnie's a little like he may be a big nerd but like he's not ashamed of who he is either yeah. so he's just doing his thing yeah. and it's his parents that are a problem and it's yeah. another king thing of like teens and kids see things a certain way and adults are kind of skewed and don't and get, don't get it right right <laughs> like, yeah well if the adults in this movie are like specifically the parents but they're just like obstacles really yeah they're I mean, not they're real just, even characters they're just standing in yeah. the way or they're just like extremely hostile to arnie like yeah. darnell is an asshole his parents yeah. are kind of like his mom's a bitch to him <laughs> it's I like mean, yeah. they're just like this hostile force that's just like in the way of making him happy and so you like you understand lines that are completely over the top it's like you know i think some of parents their part of their job is like trying to kill their kid <laughs> it's yeah. like well i, I mean guess. yeah and to david's point that's a very like that's a very true through line in a lot of stephen king's writing like just in general like if you watch it you Jerry, know like all, right? yeah like all the all the parents and a lot of his at least the movies that have been um you know adapted or the the books that have been adapted to movies like they're all pretty bad news evil like if you look the latest it like they're even like kind of grotesquely overdone Mm -hmm. to kind of to kind of prove their how evil they are but i think in the in it specifically they're sort of affected by it without well sure it plays it it plays i mean yeah it's part part of the yeah yeah it's part of what's going on there but like it's every adult in that in that movie is is uh you'd be hard to find one that's not like really cast as a dark kind of figure yeah like carrie's uh, like that right carrie her mom is is completely in the high school folks everyone's terrible (laughs) i don't know so yeah i mean i think maybe maybe is king always just saying uh look everything's terrible everywhere and sometimes bad things happen and sometimes you get caught up in kind of kind of crazy situations and sometimes they, they come I think back. he's just saying that he had a really shitty uh child <laughs> yeah. Yeah. that's he what he's not he, 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 he did not get along with his family <laughs> doesn't like his parents did not get along with uh you know certain people in high school you know he was get girls he was cruising in the in the 50s cruising around with his boys and couldn't couldn't find a girl to to go steady and that's like most of what all of these stories are about <laughs> until he got his 58th 
his 58 <laughs> Plymouth Fury. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> he was looking for girls to go steady and it wasn't working. I don't know. But clearly, like, yeah, I I I I'm I'm intrigued. I don't read a lot of fiction. I read more nonfiction. Uh, same as like, uh, but I'm like, geez, I should just be reading these. Like, what's so scary about this? Come on, is it scary? And I'm, I, I think I'd be into it. <laughs> I uh, I have I, I think I have most of the early Stephen King novels. I worked on a show where one of the one of the bits in it was that one of the characters like was obsessed with Stephen King books, oh. and so we had every episode we had like she's like reading a different Stephen King book. Yeah. So I would have to clear all those with his estate and his reps. And at the end of the show, like John just stole had a them. ton of Stephen King books. So like you can have these, like they're just going to get thrown away or something. So nice. Like I have yet to read a single one of them, but they're <laughs> most of them right here. But My Car- mom used to have the full collection and, and I, they're all gone. I don't have any of those books anymore. Yeah. Which I which remember in the eighties, you can you could call a toll free number and get Stephen King books delivered to your door for like nineteen ninety five. I think there was like is that a, real? Yeah, it was like a subscription like, to like, like a time time li- is it like yeah, a time, time life subscription. Col- Columbia House didn't do. Holy books, cow! Right? I didn't know that. Yeah, no, I don't like, think you can get like three at once at the start. You can get Pet Cemetery and Care. Or, but that's and funny. I don't remember that. And I then see every it sounds commercial. familiar. Every month you'll get a new Stephen King book, or not every month, but like every so often you'll get a Stephen King book or something like that. Wow. Um, but like so, but so John Carpenter's probably, I mean, if someone's gonna take a Stephen King book, right? Carpenter's a good choice, right? That's it's a good match, you'd think they yeah. could have a, a lot of fun together. Yeah. And well, I they're think... both into rock and roll and uh you know, cars, hey, I guess. Yes. George Thorogood <laughs> yeah. Yeah. persists even into this decade with like being played on a goddamn trailer or of something I'm like the kids don't know what this song is stop using it no <laughs> one cares about bad to the bone like stop that's what it reminded me of <laughs> like i feel like i've heard it like within the last five six years on like new movies you know so we're, we're a good song but we we're cares? talking earlier about about king you know, I, I'm not King Carpenter, not really loving this movie, you know, this not being one of his favorites. And there's something about it to me that, I mean, I guess I can't really pinpoint it, but overall there's, it, it doesn't seem to have that passion that, you know, all those other ones we were mentioning that we, that we love like this one. I, I don't, I don't feel that on this one and I don't know exactly what it is. It just, maybe it just feels a little bit like, yeah, he's, He's doing this. This isn't his story. This is somebody else's that he's putting a stamp on. Um, and it certainly visually, you know, mostly looks like a traditional Carpenter film. But well, I don't know, and, what, it, and what Blake mentioned earlier is, I mean, he came on. This was very much a paycheck, you know, just to yeah. like to secure, you know, the, an opportunity to possibly direct again down the, down the future because he felt like everything was slipping away so i'm sure it wasn't like the greatest of times in his in in his movie making uh career you know well and he probably didn't want to with that being said wanting it to be a hit he probably didn't want to rock the boat too much either and you know maybe he didn't uh i don't know maybe he didn't do everything that he normally would have had he had full con- like complete control over it I don't know. Yeah, I, uh, you know, he, I, th- I think he basically, the, the reason he gives, and I think, you know, it, it has probably mostly to do with the circumstances of, of which he made it, um, and it not being something that he was the driving force behind, but he says it's not scary, and you, you know, it's just like the, the, the idea inherently is not scary, and, you know, and it's kind of silly in some ways, uh, and, you know, I hear a lot of criticism of it from people that, you know, from the Carpenter books, the people mm-hmm. that write about it. And I, I just, you know, my my response to that is like the very few movies are, you know, actually like actually scary. And uh, and, you know, what people that are into horror movies are drawn to isn't necessarily like the thrill of being genuinely scared. I mean, there's like the roller coaster ride of, mm-hmm. you know, the jump scares and stuff, but it's, 
that horror movies tell interesting stories about their characters. And yeah. So what I, I've always been drawn to me is not like that Christine is this haunted car and it's killing people. Like that's not what this movie's about to me. I mean, the movie's right. always been about that, Arnie. that Arnie, what Christine is doing to him. Like it's, it's, you know, to me, I've always been fascinated in horror with, the horror movies that deal with like loss of identity, whether it's like the thing mm -hmm. or even the or even Romero zombie movies to a certain extent, body invasion, snatchers. Of the, mm -hmm. invasion of the body snatcher 78 is one of my favorite uh, movies of all time. Even the fly, you know, like he's in that speech that he gives about like, you know, insect politics and the fly and how he's kind of like, you don't come anymore. Cause I don't know. You'll get hurt. Like, and I, I, I can't control it. And so like the fact that it's changing Arnie, like that's what's that's that's what the movie is about. That's mm -hmm. what's interesting about it, at least for me. And you know, and I just it's always been like this really poignant like metaphor. I mean, people say uh, for puberty, and I get that, and that like he grows from being like a goofy teenager into a man by the end of the movie. But it's like it's this wacky like love story about a guy that falls in love with the wrong woman, and yep. you know, the obsession of it. I don't know. I, for some reason, maybe I'm different. Like I totally relate to like love when you're a teenager, when you like the first time you fall in love, when you have all those like hormones going on and you don't know how to control anything, it's intense and you don't really know how to deal with it. Yeah. And it it's very like, it's just, it's like all encompassing in some way. And to me, like that's what's happening to Arnie. And in a way, like it's the movie that captures like that first teenage love better than any movie I've ever seen. <laughs> like, yeah, man. He just happens to fall in love with an older woman who's really kind of possessive and jealous. <laughs> and who's a car. And she's got a, a quite a tailpipe. Um, <laughs> so, but yeah, like you could make the same movie with like a, like a vampire succubus or something as, you know, he, he, this nerd who meets this woman and then, He's in a relationship with her and no one's like no one understands it no one wants that in their their life and he's like yeah but she gets me and all that and then he's changed by it and then and then meanwhile she's murdering all his friends or his enemies friends and enemies or whatever and it Isn't could be a the jim same carrey exact... movie what's that was it once bitten or something was that a jim once carrey bitten. movie oh uh, is that, yeah, is that right. the plot well, of that movie more <laughs> yeah. yep so like i totally see this as like oh yeah it's the same it could yeah like you said it's it's certainly like and I think what the movie like maybe lacks is like him with the car just a little bit more together, whether he's fixing her up or he's sort of like, you know, you, you get the sense, you know, he finally sort of starts to understand her and he's like, show me. And she repairs herself. And it's like, that's great, great reverse shot. You know? Yeah. Um, I think that's a great scene, but like, yeah, I think, I think, I think it maybe is missing just a little bit more of him with the car and not that you need a, a lot. I don't think you need a lot. I think you just need a, like an, an extra couple minutes and then just to really understand like, oh, the car is really, really taken over him for him. And he doesn't even realize it though. Cause like, right. you know, before Christine gets all wrecked by the boys, he's like, he's telling um, Lee, the, the girl he's, at, the, the human girl he's dating, like, Hey, we should go, we should apply to the same colleges. Like he still has a mindset to be with her he doesn't realize he's in love with the car right you now. So I, I, I feel like maybe that's where it's lacking a little bit of like, um, like that exploration of like where his, like where his obsession or loyalties are. Or whatever. We don't, we don't really see. I mean, I, I don't think we see too many scenes of just him in the car at all. Right. It's really no. just that moment where, you know, the show me scene where, where the car sort of reveals its powers to him, but there's no other scenes where it's just, the two of them together you know well, it's yeah. when he when he leaves leaves house after the drive-in mm -hmm. and she won't start he's like you know oh yeah oh yeah right right yep i that mean there's a time. couple of instances but you're right i mean there isn't a whole lot of it not that like and i get it like it's almost like i think hiding all that hiding all that stuff is also helpful to the like where when he talk when he coaxed the car to actually talk uh starting like oh you know, he's talking like, hey, baby, it's OK. Don't worry. I didn't, she means nothing to me. <laughs> like, <laughs> OK, like that's that's a clever scene. I like that one. <laughs> like, um, 
Well, it's really, ah. and the, the story is really a tragedy on top of a love story. You know, what, what that, the, the complete arc of Arnie's character and how far, you know, off the rails he goes. And then, you know, eventually, spoiler alert, eventually when he's, when he's killed at the end, it's really just, I mean, he has a quick moment and then it's, he's like out of the movie, <laughs> you know, your, your lead is really sort of just gone and discarded. Yeah. And then the Christine is left with just rage. Well, right. and the ending, like, I guess it makes you, that points to the fact that like the other scenes where we saw Christine killing, he was in the car the whole time. Like this at least sort of indicates that he was probably there. Most it's, likely. Yeah. Like, it's a tough call because I mean, he does the Christine all burn up does show up at Darnell's and there's no oh, that's real, true. Yeah, real okay. sign that he was there. And then why uh, did Darnell get in the car? Yeah, that is <laughs> it's burned up, it's ashy, it's disgusting, it's burned <laughs> plastic rubber, vinyl, <laughs> foam. Sometimes you I just love, gotta get into it. You just I like, love oh, Darnell. I love, I love Darnell, but it is uh that is like one of the silliest moments in terms of a character uh yeah <laughs> motivation. <laughs> Darnell Robert played by Prosky. Robert Prosky, come on, like one of just was he not in almost everything in the 80s and 90s? And he saw him oh, a yeah. lot. I mean, that's a great cast of character yeah. actors. You know, you got Harry Dean right. Stanton and him. And it's just a, it's a fantastic surrounding cast of yeah. characters that just kind of like come in and, and uh, do their thing. And only one, only, uh, only Harry Dean is the returning uh, carpenter, you know, actor, right? Everyone else was new at this point. Yeah, Harry Dean probably. Was in, what the he was in Escape from New York. I'm trying to think if yeah. he was in anything else at the time. Um, I don't think yeah, Carpenter I guess that's was. it. Yeah. I always think it's interesting that both John Stockwell and Keith Gordon went on to be directors. I, I know like, it's funny, <laughs> <laughs> but Keith Gordon has talked about how like because he was interested in directing, and so Carpenter on his like the days that when he wasn't didn't need to be on set he would come and carpenter would like show him the framing and yeah and kind of like kind of show him the ropes which i always thought was kind of cool story well i mean and he didn't really i after back to school was the last movie i remember seeing keith gordon as a, at least a lead role i mean maybe he appeared in things after that but um his He's, acting career didn't last all that long yeah he was in a couple things up until he'd pop into stuff but yeah he was in De dexter oh yeah way later yeah 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 Yeah, like i think he was like you know he would i'm sure he was like off like hey we would love to have you on this i don't think he was like looking for it since he he stayed really busy directing so yeah yeah and then stockwell too i mean to i think top gun was the last uh the last time he had a major, major acting role before he switched to directing too. So well, he did Blue Crush, Blue one of my Crush, favorites. The <laughs> legendary Blue Crush. <laughs> um, but yeah, and Alexandra Paul, who you know, I most uh, like, I really knew her from Baywatch at the time. But um, you know, I think she was acting, and you know, I don't know if she's still acting. I haven't seen her in a, quite some time, but. And there's there's that story of she she has a twin sister, and uh, they played switcheroo on Carpenter one day, yeah. <laughs> and, what? and the sister showed up, and I forgot what scene it was for, but uh, the sister the one where up, she's shifting gears in the car, I know that, yeah. like, but yeah, she she totally switched out with her <laughs> sister for that scene. They had no idea. That's that's awesome. When an actor has a twin, the twin has to. You have to change the script so the twin could be in the movie, right? Like you have to. Yeah. You do a dream sequence where she's talking. The characters talking to themselves. It's a must. You just gotta. Terminator <laughs> Two is uh, the best. Uh, the best <laughs> use of twins right there. Yeah. I loved it. Oh man, Linda and Jackie Lin Hamilton. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, she might sure be that this, it might be Sarah Hamilton, to be honest with you. I think it is. That sounds that sounds faintly familiar. <laughs> yeah, I think it's anyway. Sorry. So, uh, anyway, go ahead. <laughs> so Blake, so so let's circle around to to more of your expertise. The Carpenter and Alan Howarth score here. Where does that uh, where does that rank for you amongst the other uh, team ups for those guys? 
it's among one of my favorites. Um, I think it gets overshadowed by the fact that there's so many, you know, needle drop, you know, rock yeah. and roll songs in it. Yeah. Uh, it's probably got the least amount of score in any of his movies, but I think it's a really underrated score uh, because it doesn't get talked about very much. Um, he started working with Howard for Escape from New York. Mm-hmm. And uh, Howarth was just a, he was, <laughs> Howarth is a really, <laughs> Alan is a really interesting guy. I've talked to Alan several times. Uh, I've hung out with Alan uh, outside of, you know, interviewing him. And he's going to be in the movie if we get to make it. And hopefully John will too. But uh, I'm waiting to see if we can get funding before we start reaching out to too many people. Yeah. But Alan was just like this huge synth guy. He was a uh, like a synth tech for the band uh, Weather Report in the 70s, which is how he got out to California from, I think, the Cleveland area, if I'm not mistaken, where he owned a, like a music shop where he sold, you know, musical instruments and synthesizers. That was kind of his expertise. And uh 79 he was hired to make the for all the original star wars movie uh star trek movies excuse me he made all the sounds of the enterprise like it going from oh really uh, you know like all the special sound effects he created those for i think one through six if i'm not mistaken uh but so i think motion picture was his first job in the in the movie business Mm -hmm. and uh, somebody who knew Carpenter knew him and John was looking for somebody to collaborate with who was more of a tech guy because that's not John's strong suit. So he said, Oh, you should be in, you should meet my friend, Alan. He went over to Glendale, California and they hung out and then he's like, all right, so you want to do it? So they did escape from New York through, I think they live. Um, and then Alan went on to score Halloween movies four through six by yeah. himself. And I always wonder if that's why they never worked together again. I don't. I wonder that know. too, if there was some bad blood. He says John gave him consent to go ahead and do it, but I, I don't know. Cause John has hold has held weird grudges for yeah. a lot of people like Cundy and yeah. Dean Cund- the, and Dean Cundy didn't end up shooting this run, but they hadn't split up. They were just, I don't know what kind he was working on, but he might not yeah. be available. But uh, he, you know, Alan says for Halloween too, he just kind of, out, you know, John just said, I'm like, I'm going to be busy making the thing. Just like, here's the original recordings. You go ahead and score it, even though it's kind of credited as John in association with Alan. According to Alan, like he was the real driving force, but using all of John's original recordings, which was not far different from how they usually worked, which is that John would like lay down the main themes and then Alan would come in and build things on top of it, like build textures and make it sound bigger. But it was all Alan's equipment. So I think when we think about the quintessential John Carpenter sound, we think about that those 80s movies specifically. And without Alan, those movies, those soundtracks wouldn't sound the way they do. Absolutely. And, yeah. uh, so even though like, you know, John deserves you know, all the credit in the world for like the great scores, I think especially his scores for with Alan are considered pretty special amongst the people that, that love this kind of music and love those movies. And they're really, you know, like I, the Alan even though he maybe wasn't writing the melodies and stuff for a lot of it, I, as they went on, Alan started to do more of that, but he's the one that created the carpenter sound. They were, it was like his equipment. And then he would buy new equipment for the next one. And uh, even the thing, the couple of cues that they do together for the thing are, is right around this time. So we get a lot of the same equipment. So there's a lot of connection with uh, the way they sound um but the thing there was just john just needed more music and he couldn't he just didn't want to bother trying to get a translator and getting more going to do more right. music so he just called alan and said like i need like a couple of things i'm going to come over and uh they just had a really great relationship i don't exactly know what happened other than the late 80s going into the 90s like there was a big transition in carpenter's work you know life yeah. 
you know, by that point, I think, I, mean, I don't know when they met, but then maybe it was Starman. Maybe that's when Sandy King started working with him as like a script supervisor or something. And uh, he just started to kind of branch away from the people that he had previously been uh, uh, collaborating with and moving on to uh, just like different things. And it's a shame, but it's understandable. I mean, he worked with Jim Lang and that only lasted two uh, scores, body bags and in the mouth of madness. And I've interviewed Jim and he, <laughs> there's a very interesting story as to why that happened. And if you guys ever do in the mouth of madness, I'll come back and tell that story. We'll, we'll get there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I love it. And I recently watched Prince of Darkness um, for the first time in a long time. And I said, you hear a lot of similarities in not just the sound, but also in the melodies and stuff. I mean, he's definitely got a, uh, a style and it's, it's minimalistic. Um, you know, John always says like, he's, he's not as interested in Mickey mousing, which is like kind of just like emphasizing all the action, but he likes to like lay a not like nice shag carpeting. <laughs> that just, you know, just kind of ties the room together. Just, <laughs> just, the, just right. Well, and, and if you guys liked everything you just heard, you can hear a lot more on Scored to Death, the the podcast, the books, but also, you know, chip in for the Kickstarter and you're going to get that documentary. So uh, you get so much more, right, Blake? Yeah, we've got a lot of great people involved and uh, all that kind of stuff. We're getting way into how music works in horror movies. But John's influence on... Look, John Carpenter is bigger now than he ever was. And it has yeah, to do with social media. It has to do with, uh, you know, all these companies that are distributing old horror movies. Uh, mm. And then he became a rock star. And his influence on music and film scoring is probably more present now than it was then. You know, he's just he's really entered like a whole other stratosphere of like popularity and influence, which is kind of crazy. Well, well, it's also because people our age who grew up loving his movies are now, you know, in maybe better positions to recognize, you know, his work and help, you know, help that cult status really just become, you know, rise to the surface again. But yeah, you're totally right. Like he is John Carpenter is definitely more popular now than ever and there's just so much merchandise and then with the new halloween movies getting his name back out there again to to new audiences and who i'm sure have gone back and not only watched the halloween movies but other carpenter movies too so and and i'm just i couldn't be happier for him but i think his music is kind of brilliant in this movie um in in, in a lot of scenes i mean it's there's like a, a sweetness to a lot of the, to some of the cues because I mean it's dealing with romance mm-hmm. even in, in such an odd way more so than most of his other movies, and of course like you know he's working with a music supervisor but so I don't really know how much input he has to the songs they choose for Christine to play but uh, mm. you know obviously those are such a big part of the narrative yeah. It's, a yeah. beautiful hybrid of, of score and and songs for soundtrack i'd be surprised if they weren't in the script to begin with or at least some of them right because just lyric lyric the lyrics themselves kind of communicate right like well they're they're christine's voice really yeah, you like know what she's saying yeah i wondered that this time around which is like i was, I was wondering if that how much of them were actually written in the script i know it's kind of a no-no to put songs in a oh, spot titles true? in a script but in a circumstance like this like john said where it's like it's really the voice of that character i could totally see that that would have been and i don't know again since none of us have read the book we don't know if, if those kinds of things are written into the book either well, we can only speculate here <laughs> that's what no but john's yeah. gonna read the book john's gonna start reading the book and then he's he's gonna send it out yeah start right now and we'll talk and you guys keep going. Know. I'll give you a page by page update. What? Blake, well, we're going to have to get John on, a, on an episode and talk about Baby Driver uh, and the music of Baby Driver driving the narrative. And I don't know where you lay and where you fall on on that whole that whole piece of work. 
uh i know john's oh, the fan. soundtrack is great okay I, I, you know i get a lot of flack because i'm not i'm not a baby driver lover here but <laughs> for me but, particularly yeah. but i'm a fan i like <laughs> And Blake um, stays silent because he's like, I don't give a shit. <laughs> uh, I haven't seen it. I was just. Oh, you haven't like, seen Baby I, I, I haven't seen it in a long time. I saw it like back when it came out. So it's, I can't comment specifically on the score, but my mind went to like, what if Baby Driver, the car was Christine? And I started having this whole other Ooh, movie play nice. in, my, in my brain while you were talking. That's why I kind of shut out. That's I was watching se- a whole other movie. I was watching that's, Baby Christine Driver. That's oh, my the God. Sequel. That's that should the be it. Right there. That's, that's it. <laughs> sequel to Christine Nailed it. Baby Driver. But yeah, the, the, you know, going back to the to the songs they chose, you know, they're all very. They may or may not have been scripted. I mean, Probably you know, the, that, I don't maybe. think there's a lot of direct ties to the lyrics of the song to whatever's happening. So, you know, you could probably swap out similar songs if you had to, if you couldn't clear it or you couldn't get the rights to it. But um, yeah, it's just interesting how how you know, how well it worked for to speak as Christine and really, you know, get her as a character really across more, you know, through those songs almost more than anything else. Yeah. I mean, of course, you know, you hear me knocking and you can't come in and, mm-hmm. uh, uh, just bad so many <laughs> bad to the bone, of course. Although yeah. I don't know if Christine ever plays bad to the bone. No, it's that really, one no. I think is just soundtrack. <laughs> That's just the soundtrack, yeah. yeah. It's, not her, it's not coming on her radio. Maybe her she's thinking song. it though, because she was born in '57, right? Or yeah. Whatever. So that's not out yet. And yeah. uh, rock you know, roll here to stay. Rock roll is oh, yeah. the, the song that plays when Arnie's dying. Uh, is that we were Arnie. together? Yeah. Uh, should have been if he just wore a seatbelt. He wouldn't have died. If he didn't pull the glass out, he might have survived. You know, that's, they always yeah. say like, leave it in there. You know, yeah. he yeah. just. If you just left it in, yeah. I mean, they, they, they didn't stay. give that advice in the seventies, <laughs> though. <laughs> Can I just comment though on the the design of the of Christine when Christine is? I know we're, we're I'm sort of backtracking, but like when Christine is the murder vehicle and driving around, and the sh- just I mean they picked a perfect vehicle oh, to awesome manipulate, car. right? Like yeah. what is it the Fury? Yeah, the uh, Fury. Well, they had the Plymouth Fury, but they used a couple other cars as well, like the uh, was a Belvedere, and then there was another one as well to like get it for each of the scenes. But they had, they had a total of I think twenty four cars that they used, all which diff, you know did specific things depending what the shot was. You know they right. would they would you know tailor the car for whatever you know needed to happen. But like in the climax, obviously, like when you see where he's attack, like Christine's attacking, and it's like the, the hood is torn up, and it looks like teeth and eyes yeah. and all. But like, but the previous murders of just there's this slightly cartoonish change of 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 a very specific shape of this car that makes it and the way it's shot, where you would normally shoot you shoot when you shoot people around cars and all that, you're shooting for the people. But now you're just shooting the car as the villain. And not in that overt way where you're shooting up and like it looks it has a personality to it. I mean, I thought I think I mean, it was just so well executed from from the design and and how it was shot. I was just like, I'm really digging this without making it like we've got to animate a demon car. It's like, no, this is a car that's like intimidating on its own. Dude, when I just, it's on I, fire driving like that's yeah. oh, well, that's ass. fantastic. That's <laughs> like it. That shot of, of it coming down the road just in flames. Well, first of all, it's just it's an amazing stunt with the with the you know yeah. an actual some stunt man driving it. Yeah. Um, for that whole sequence and just visually, that's just that's like that was the most you know horrific moment for me is seeing that like that that would scare me like if well, I, if that's coming after me you know <laughs> for, for years me. I I didn't really think about it until you were just talking about that but. You know, for years I used to say like it might not be his best movie, but I always felt like it was probably his best directed movie for those reasons. Like I'm always really impressed when they take something that's not, you know, inanimate for <laughs> for all intents and purposes and make it a real character. Or even like I always, it's one of the reasons why I, I'm a big fan of Romero's Monkey Shines. It's because like I think mm-hmm. does a brilliant job of making that the monkey like this like a real character yeah, and, right. and 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 a very similar situation she's yeah, a jealous yeah. <laughs> it's a weird love story too <laughs> yeah uh but christine yeah like he does 
like, yes, obviously it's the design of the car, the headlights and, uh, you know, the, just the, the grill. It, it's, 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 it's not that far of a stretch to be able to imagine like a human face or, or like a humanoid type face that we would, uh, that you could translate onto that. But I think the, you're correct. Like in the way he shoots it and how it's all handled, like he does a brilliant job of like selling that idea of that. This is a character and that he can cut to that car and the way he, the, the angle he chooses, it's like, you know, that the, that the car is watching what, yeah. <laughs> you know, the action that's happening. Yeah. I think, I think those, I think those shots really stand out and like help temp, like help really enforce like how menacing the car can be. I I don't, it's not just a car doing shit. Like it's got a personality to it that that's that that's reinforced through that those shots. I just I, uh, I'm a big fan. Like I, I was that, reading that, some criticism about it where they were like, well, you know, it's like it's it's kind of silly because and really Buddy Repperton is the only one that does this, just like runs down the middle of the street instead yeah. of like you know, but, but, but like Moochie does. Moochie tries to get away, but I yeah. also like you know, you the people that are criticizing it for those things are like thinking of it like the characters know that it's this haunted car. Like they right. don't. They think, you know, Cuntingham is driving <laughs> this car, and yeah. like that he they don't necessarily think that he's gonna run them over. And you know, like well, I would this critique that I was reading is like, you know, he does, but they don't run. They just they could run into a house, someplace a car can't go. It's like yeah, but so they think somebody's driving that car. Well, didn't and, uh, didn't um, didn't he run down an alley? Yeah, that, and it's, like the car can't fit Chris, through, and it just Mucci. he still got him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I mean, it bullies its way till it gets him. I mean, it would have done the same thing probably. And, and Mucci is a guy who had to who had to hitchhike with a trucker to be dropped off where he <laughs> lives, which is apparently an industrial area, like no neighborhood. There's no houses. He just lives. He just lives, I guess, and in an alley. Somewhere. Christine knows knows that too. Which and Christine is, was which waiting. Is... She had the she had the 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 school, uh, the like the school information, uh, like where everybody lives. I don't for know. The, for the longest time, the the last bunch of years that I've watched this movie and talked about it on things like Saturday movie sleepovers, like I can't get out of my head. At some point, I it had this realization that like the bad guys in this movie, besides the fact that Buddy, Buddy Repperton is like forty years old, I know, <laughs> which goes to which goes to you know, it's believable that he wouldn't. He's not a smart guy. He wouldn't think. He's obviously repeated several grades for decades. Yeah. He's but a like a forty-five-year-old get... <laughs> who's still a, a he's, high school uh, senior. He's only twenty-four <laughs> when they shoot this, which is crazy. But when he's I, only two years older than uh, than Keith Dave, uh, Keith Gordon. But like, I can't uh, I can't get out of my. At some point, it dawned on me that this is like the evil mirror universe of like the sweat hogs from Welcome Back, Potter. <laughs> oh man, so, totally. <laughs> so, totally. Now, so now I just always imagine like Horshack and. Well, Barberino, Steven, Steven Tash, who is one of the <laughs> hooligans who you might know from the opening, one of the opening scenes of Ghostbusters, yep. like totally has that that Cotter kind of oh, yeah. vibe to him, like big hair and all that, and just sort of. <laughs> and then <laughs> yeah. we we had a uh, Stuart Charno, I think, is the, was the redhead, uh, you know, one of that group who was from Friday the Thirteenth Part Two. Yeah, that's right. He played Vandenberg. So, like, where they all got murdered in that gas station explosion. Yeah. Like, oh boy. That I mean, that that's probably. I don't know. Like, I I have a. I I love that scene. You know, the, the revenge scene with Christine, where she you know stalks e each of them and and you know gets every one of them. But uh, yeah. I, there's another shot that I really liked, which was when at the football game where Dennis is like running towards the camera, and then we see his perspective as he's going for like the big catch right he looks up and he sees uh arnie and lee like making out on on the hood of christine and he just like i mean i think he's a is he heartbroken over or is he just confused of like what's happening to arnie all of a sudden or does he have feelings for lee there because it's a little bit vague if they like what their relationship is with each other but that's where he's distracted and gets nailed and that's how he gets injured I think it's like I, a whole mess, right? Like, yeah, I think yeah. it's a whole like confusion on yeah. many what levels. What the shit? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the shot that I always love it. Every time I see it, I just like, and it's the simplest shot, but it's the fact that Carpenter holds on it for so long, and the and the music is when Dennis drops Artie off after dropping Christine off at Darnell's, 
And he's like, you know, you better go. You don't want to be around for this shit. And then it's just like the shot of Dennis pulling away with that Bonnie Raitt song, that Bonnie Raitt cover playing. And Carpenter just holds on it for Mm -hmm. way longer than he needs to. And then it fades, which is, you know, Carpenter's the, you know, with especially with the thing is like the master of the fade. And I just, (laughs) for some reason, I love that shot. And then there's, it's the simplest thing, but every time I'm like, ah, damn, that's, it's such a Carpenter shot. Yeah. Well, uh, another thing that stands out was when Dennis shows up. We don't know why he's showing up to Arnie's house. Arnie's in a fight with his parents, and he, you know, they're yelling at him. And this is after he's established with Christine and all that. And then he just walks out of the house, and he's then says, "Oh, hey!" And then he and then Arnie sees him. And he goes, "Oh shit!" Like as though the <laughs> worst thing ever happened. And it's just like he forgot to tell Dennis, like I can't hang out tonight. <laughs> like. I, mean, I just love that take. I love whatever, whatever they, they, why that was chosen as the take where he's just, like, oh, sh- yet. Like <laughs> it's unbelievable. It's, it's a little bit of overacting in a sense, like for what that is. But clearly, Arnie has a lot of priorities that, you know, he wasn't uh, thinking about, thinking about his boy Dennis, who's now out of the hospital or pre hospital. No, out of the hospital. Out of the hospital. Yeah, I think he was out of the hospital at that. Because of course, our boy, our boy Dennis took a lot, took a big hit on that that football scene. Yeah, uh, and had to be football in, career in the hospital. And we saw Arnie visit him like twice over three months, <laughs> and like for five seconds. Oh, hey, all right, I'm out. Bye. Like later. <laughs> hey, you like beer, right? You hey. like beer. <laughs> See ya. Bye. <laughs> It, like, well, in it, Arnie's defense, he does say that he stopped like three, three or four times. That's true. And that's he was true. always asleep and early on, and then he just—that's a good point. Arnie was a, a loyal friend. In was that true though? Anyway. Was it? Was it true? I believe him. Yeah, probably. I, I think in those early days, Arnie was trying to maintain his friendship. But then that this that, was this viewing was also the first time I recognized the movie that they're watching at the at the drive-in oh, what oh, is i actually i actually watched this movie not too long ago it's this crazy like disco movie from 1978 called thank god it's friday starring donna summer uh jeff goldblum and deborah winger which is like oh, one my. of those like oh. hollywood one wacky crazy night movies <laughs> you know, that, <laughs> that happens that takes place at this disco that jeff goldblum's character owns and it's all these like little these characters and their stories at the disco and uh i just watched it for no particular reason just because i was like hey it's fucking jeff goldblum and yeah. it's this crazy he's, he's the disco total package yeah. <laughs> disco <laughs> movie from the 70s and i watched it and i was when i watched it this time i was like oh like this is the first time i know the movie they're watching i've That's seen funny. this movie <laughs> so check out thank god it's friday from 1978 it's classic nice. <laughs> what do you guys think so what do you think about the ending I mean, it, it's set. It's it's left with you know, Christine's been destroyed. She's been you know crunched at the junkyard, and and who isn't there a cameo? Are there a couple of cameos in the junkyard scene? Yeah, well, someone shows up, but I, I'm assuming that's that's an well, the, important person. Yeah, I don't know. The guy with the with the boom box is somebody. I don't know if he's like the producer. Or yeah, I think like it's that. one of the one of the producers, <laughs> but. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's it's left sort of open ended that, you know, is did is Christine really dead? I mean, she it just that that piece of metal just wiggles like right at the end. Do we, yeah, do well, we... that's that's Carpenter, right? You yeah, know, that's another yeah. Carpenter thing. It's either uncertain, uh, open ended or just like uh or the evil has won. Those are like the two right. Carpenter endings. It's either yeah. like we don't know what's happened, <laughs> if it's over, or it or it succeeded in yeah. in, in it. You know, um, but that you know that became a big thing after uh, De Palma's ending of Carrie. Carrie. That's like yep. that became like every movie had to have that now. <laughs> mm-hmm. But Carpenter is certainly like a master of it. Uh, you know, I I started recently thinking about when you get these kind of movies and especially because we see now all these sequels from the Halloween movies Mm -hmm. and you see like what has happened to Lori. But when you look at like any of those movies and specifically talking like John Carpenter, like 
Yeah, now I always wonder, like, what the hell happened to Lee and Dennis? <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, like, like they went through this ordeal. They're be- like, Dennis's best friend died. Yeah, her boyfriend died. Like, do they find solace in each other? Uh, you know, uh, Chris, like, dark. When I watched Prince of Darkness, I felt that too. I was like, man, the people that survived this, like, they are sc- even if they did succeed, which it's unclear. Like they're just screwed up for the rest of their life. Like yeah. they, <laughs> they're going to have car trauma forever. And well, that's gonna, what then, are they going to do? Then Dennis and Lee, you know, they're probably voted for Trump. I don't know. I don't, I can't say, which is fine. You vote for who you like. Uh, I'm just I, I thought you were going to say prom King and queen, but yeah, <laughs> that, that's that too. That's true. Uh, so, you know, I, uh, yeah, I would, I would have loved to, I would love a follow, a Christine follow up. I, I think you could, <laughs> I think, I feel like you could do a sequel. I mean, if written well and made sense, I mean, you know, it, took, it took 20 years. It's right? a big caveat. I know. If written well and made sense. <laughs> could, you, could you imagine some, both. like, some, some, some gen z teen in high school driving a plymouth fury to school and, there's people uh, who love old cars you know yeah but the kids don't the kids don't care and right? it's a it's an it's a search for dennis and lee it's got to get revenge on them. Yeah. Well, it's, it's crazy to think that christine's only 20 years old when Artie buys yeah. it you yeah. know one yeah. it's so trashed and yeah. The previous owner's only been dead for six months. So you're like, what what the hell has happened? Yeah. <laughs> if he well, loved it so much, why is it in such bad shape? Unless the brother tried to destroy it. Uh, yeah. you know, there's that great line where he's like, I told you know, I told him to get rid of it. It's just out of decency. But you know, three weeks later, it came back. Yeah. And like she, she came back. It's like such the, a great line. It's like, yeah. what do you mean it came back? It came back. But like the brother also, I'm think is wearing like a scoliosis vest or something like that, right? Like yeah, something. He's got for some his, kind of brace on, yeah. Some sort of brace, which is not. You don't need to explain it. It's just there. It's almost like, it's a, as if he was in a wheelchair or had an iPad. It's like you don't need to explain it. That's just what. It, but I found it an interesting choice in terms of whatever they were doing, like because you don't you don't see those like un like you don't see a lot of those unexplained things without it trying to be. Well, it gives know. yeah, it gives his character more uh, depth just There's, by having you know that piece of wardrobe. Yeah, 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 I love what he's wearing, like the suit jacket over it. Yeah, the yeah second yeah. time Dennis comes around. Yeah, like what are you doing <laughs> he's, here? He's putting he's putting cardboard over his broken window. Yeah, I think. I think if we, I think if we really went for the sequel, it would it would really need to be a road trip movie, like yeah. a Dumb and Dumber kind of. You know, he's driving across. The, he's got to get to where Dennis and Lee are in wherever yeah and it's just a it's a it's a road trip comedy until the end then he kills them and then it is and then it's just the main character and christine on a beach having, <laughs> having my ties <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, well they're working on a remake right so we'll probably get a sequel off of that so are they doing a remake now uh i, I heard so. was that yeah announced well, recently right yeah it's with a yeah, yeah. with a uh, saturn ion is the main <laughs> vehicle it's crazy <laughs> Yeah, no, I think Blum, I think Blumhouse is doing the remake. Of course, not. I'm in. Surprising. I'm in. I'm in for a Christine remake. I will watch it. I'm there. Give me this. This is the horror I can get behind. Inanimate objects killing people. That's fine. <laughs> well, uh, I think we should. It's about time we should take a look at how it did at the box office with box office glory. Okay, so. Let's talk some numbers and how uh, how this one ended up. Budget was ten million dollars. It comes out December 9th, nineteen eighty three, right up against Sudden Impact and Scarface. So this Ooh. is your these are your holiday films in nineteen eighty three. It's your Christmas movies. Yeah, um, yeah that's a tough one. Nineteen eighty three. You're you're going against Al Pacino and Clint Eastwood. That's a uh, no that's thanks. Heavy competition. I mean. Wow. Clint Eastwood's Christine's still... the one that's bad to the bone. So exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, it uh, it opened up at number four, uh, sadly, uh, right right between Terms of Endearment and Yentl. Oh, yeah, tough tough spot. Um, it it uh, had a three point four million opening weekend. It took in about twenty one point two worldwide, so it did make money. Um, you know, I don't think it was the 
the major financial hit that probably everybody wanted and hoped for, but, but that was a, you know, a, a tough, tough weekend to come out on. I don't know why they wouldn't have, I don't know, you know, I, I don't know what the schedule was. I know they were trying to really fast track it. I mean, the book was written, the book comes out in 1983 and the movie is greenlit like immediately. So all of that had to happen pretty quick. They probably couldn't get it out in time for Halloween. They probably bought it on the original pitch of the book, right? Like, let's probably, start making I mean, this. Probably. I mean, with with how hot Stephen King was at the time, it was just green light everything that is ready, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it I mean, ends they, up... They bought the rights to the book before it was even done, right? So Probably, probably yeah. I'm pretty sure they did. Uh, it ends up number 33 of 1983 between The Right Stuff and Cujo. So you've got Christine at number 33, Cujo at 34, and The Dead Zones at 35. So I think all those Stephen King movies are all financially like hitting a very specific target. What do we think? You know, I, we kind of touched on it already, but um, where do we where do we rank Christine in the JCCU, John Carpenter <laughs> right. Cinematic Universe? Uh, where do we where do we rank it in there, Blake? You know, you said it's gone up higher in in your list recently. Yeah, I mean, like I, people ask me what my favorite John Carpenter movies are all the time uh, because of my me being very vocal about my my love for his movies. Um, it's a fluid thing, right? It's like yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, probably the thing will always be number one, um, but yeah, I mean, I. To me, there's there's very few that you know they're they're all like high or middle. Like there's yep. very, you know there's like maybe a couple at the, the at the back end that aren't my favorites, but um, it, it's definitely like high up. But uh, you know, Top five. Toward, you think? I, I definitely within the maybe not top five, but probably close. Mm -hmm. I mean, people are, I had somebody ask me like, what's your, aside from Halloween, what's your favorite John Carpenter movie? I was like, Halloween's not even like cracking my, <laughs> you know, like that's, that's middle of the road for me. Like I love, like I said, Starman. I love Starman. Uh, I love Christine. Uh, and you, you know, I don't know, maybe top five. It's, it's like I said, it's fluid. You know, it's depends on the uh, day. I think, you know, with, you know, with I, I, I just, I, I think it's, you know, going back to all the stuff we kind of said, like, I think it's really well handled, uh, you know, his direction of it. I, I, it's just, it's really solid. You know, Carpenter had a professional feel and look to his movies almost from the get-go mm -hmm. in a way that his peers in the horror genre just didn't. I mean, as much as I love Romero's movies and Texas Chainsaw Massacre is to me, one of the greatest movies ever made, they're pretty rough, you know, and, yeah. and Crave, Cra you know, Last House on the Left and Hills Have Eyes and Craven's well, movies are, are really rough. and dirty yeah, looking. And, yeah. <laughs> but Carpenter was like a, a man out of time as a director. Like his, he, you know, he wasn't, and probably still doesn't consider himself an artist. He's like, I've always thought he's like, he's the craftsman and he, what he appreciated about his favorite filmmakers, which were guys like Howard Hawks and John Ford and, and Alfred Hitchcock, which obviously were all artists in their own right. But I think what he was geared towards was like, like their professionalism and the, and the, and the, the skill in the execution of the stories they were telling and I think that those that made a big impact on him. So I think you know Christine, even of the movies, the the Stephen King movies of that era, I think Christine is the is like the prettiest looking one, like the most like real movie. I love Carrie, but it's rough around the edges. Yeah, I love Cujo, but you know, aside from its, you know, it being gritty because of you know it its story of like the dirt and the sweat and all that stuff. It is kind of rough around the edges, yeah. you know, yep. like all those movies kind of are dead zone, you know, less. So uh, I think that's kind of more, you know, of a polished film than some of the other ones. But when you watch Christine, it's just gorgeous to look at. And, uh, and so, you know, I just, I, 
you know, I've grown to just like really love it. And I love the relationships between the, the love triangle, but also Dennis and that friendship and, mm-hmm. and everything that happens with Arnie. So yeah, I'm, you know what? I'm not thinking about the other moves. I'll put it at number five. How's that? Okay. <laughs> I was going to say, you're going to talk yourself into moving it up to four or three. But... Yeah. <laughs> it's my favorite movie of all time. <laughs> yeah, <I guess>. yeah. <laughs> uh david what about you of the carpenter movies that you've seen yeah where do you put this one man i tell you with uh you know it's uh it's kind of up there with assault on precinct 13 to be honest with you i kind of like that that's a kind of more of a on that and uh a big trouble uh you know these yeah it's top five i've seen uh nine or ten carpenter movies at this point I, but I really like it. I really like watching it this time, like the whole time. Like this is great. This was a this was a lot of a lot of fun. Um, you know, uh, even with it's lacking a couple of things I would like to see, but and know more about. But I I don't think it cuts corners the way you would expect. Um, for like for what it is, so I know I just uh, it's it's up there. I'm a big fan. Nice, Brinsky. What about you? Top ten, top five. Uh, you know, it's kind of, I'm doing it in tiers. So I have like my tier one Carpenter movies that, that like are really kind of interchangeable depending on the mood I'm in. And then there's kind of the tier two ones and then there's sort of every, everything else. And so uh, I'm putting it in tier two. So like, you know, my, my tier one are things like big trouble, Halloween, the thing, and they live like, those are kind of my four. Sure. favorites of his uh that that i've seen i haven't seen all of his stuff but i've seen all, most of it um and then tier two is like escape from new york christine starman the fog assault on precinct 13 so that's hmm. it's in it's in that you know and they're all again that's like in no particular order they're just kind of interchangeable there's yeah. like these are my favorites and these are all the other ones and i i like them all that's that's kind of what where I kind of put it too. Like for me, like you, Blake, the thing is number one that that will never probably change. But then yeah, I've got my groupings of Big Trouble and Escape from New York and Halloween, and then I would put probably Christine with The Fog, They Live, um, Precinct, Assault on Precinct Thirteen. Probably forgetting something in there, but uh, Starman, I actually I will say I have not seen since I was like five. So I pretty much can say I haven't seen it at this point. So uh, that's the next one we're going to hit. But, it's beautiful. Uh, it's a beautiful movie. Yeah, I remember. And I've heard uh, I've heard parts of the, the score, um, which actually I caught, like, I think the last scene years ago on what it was airing on some late night channel. Uh, and the score I thought was absolutely beautiful, like going into the end credits. And um, so I was like, oh, man, yeah, I did not remember this at all. Got to, got to prioritize that. So, uh, but yeah, so for me, it's, it's probably running f- five or six somewhere in that zone. Yeah. Uh, but watching it this time, I, I really think I appreciated it more um, as a, you know, a carpenter, a huge carpenter fan that I am now versus when I saw it originally. So, cause this is only my second, maybe third time seeing it at all. Even though you bought it on VHS with Cat's Eye, you only, you only watched it once. I, I bought it like, you know, <laughs> never having having seen it. And yep. Uh, I'm watching it twice. Yep. And then that was it. And then this then, is what happens. Yeah. Then it was like you go to college and then it didn't make the cut of what I brought to, to college and then didn't end up buying it on DVD. And, and you know, so now just just finally circling back with it. You go to college, you get you get caught up watching uh France Watcher Faux movies and yeah. you know, trying to find real art and and uh you forget about what you packed in the in the in the, the footlocker that you brought with you, all your VHS. Well stuff. that reason like my love for horror movies, like obviously I love them and I love John Carpenter, but it was when I got to film school that it like exploded because it was for me, it was very much like a rebellious thing against the French Watcher Faux movies. And, yeah, which I which I loved. <laughs> exactly, so you know, like yeah. You know, like I love those movies, but I was like, it that though that at that period it like drove me even more into Carpenter's arms, and uh, For sure, yeah. So you know, like so I just like that was when the my love affair with John Carpenter's movies really got hot and heavy. Well, yeah, and the, 
this episode's going to release um, only a few days before Halloween ends. Uh, comes to theaters that's and right peacock where comforter is part of the is one of the composers right like he's doing and i think he released a track as of our recording um which is about a week before <laughs> the really our release of this episode so they're you know they they're they're teasing the the end of this uh this amazing um you know rebirth trilogy yeah. whatever for and you know carpenter still as relevant as as he could be I, I'm. I would be like. I feel like. Shouldn't he be getting a movie? Shouldn't he be directing soon? I don't like, think he wants to direct anymore. I. I think he yeah. has. He enjoys doing his music. I think probably he. I don't think he really is interested in any kind of spotlight or dealing with a studio ever again. I think he's. Yeah. I mean, Blake probably has a little more reference than me for sure, but uh, it, it just doesn't feel like he wants to do it i think if he really wanted to direct the movie he could could do it probably pretty quickly yeah yeah uh you know i'm not a total insider but you know i'm a little bit in that i still keep up with uh, someone that works for him who i've known for years now uh who's how i got him that john's in the i interviewed him for the first book and that's that's kind of how it i got him for it um you know, there there has been talks here and there of him trying to get back into it. I think there was some talk of him doing something for television. His way, his his wife Sandy King, who's also his producer, um, they do comic books now, and that yeah. seems to be like the biggest part of their business. But I feel like he's there's a lot of things in development um, with him, either having his name on it or mm-hmm. as a producer. I think at some point we'll probably get one more, but. Uh, it, what it will be, I'm not sure. I think he just might have mentioned that they're working on a, a fog too, but I don't know uh, if the he would dir- if he's interested in directing it or not. Uh, but to what John said, I don't think he's. I think he's he's just he doesn't he's need not interested. You yeah, know, yeah, he's, he's not interested. Well, and he's not like it was. It's surprising to hear that because he's famously like not a sequel guy, and and it always like the thing sequel comes up every so often and. He always shoots that one down and it's like if you're answering the questions that he left at the end of the movie, it's kind of killing the first, you know, that first movie. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, but we'll I would love to see McCready as a, you know, uh, like a, a power broker on Wall Street or something like that. <laughs> in twenty twenty. He made it, guys. He, he did make he's it. He's doing he's all right. Him. You know, he's still like he's just he, he changed careers. But it turns out he was the thing all along. <laughs> and Wall Street's got to deal with him. <laughs> well, it turns into they live then. Man. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Exactly. There you go. Connect all of them. Connect all the carpenter movies. <laughs> I'd but, say yeah. we probably will probably. I, w- I would say we probably get one more. Um, famously, he's been wanting to make a movie out of a book called uh, The Stars My Destination for decades. Uh, I went to see a screening of the thing in the early 2000s at Lincoln Center, and he did a QA and a and somebody asked him what if there's a project that he never had a chance to direct that he would want to direct. And uh, he said, there's this book, science fiction novel called uh, Stars My Destination, and, and I would I would love to do that, uh, but it would be too expensive. And uh, a couple of year, years after that, I was working as an editor on educational videos and some guy that I worked with brought in like a stack of old horror and sci-fi magazines that he bought. I I like a, a stoop sale in bought in Brooklyn. And uh, he just kind of brought him in to show him to me because he knew I'd be into it. And so as I'm, because back then when you were rendering things on Avid, you would, that was like the the editor, the editor's dream. Yeah. Like hit render. (laughs) See you tomorrow. <laughs> 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 but but uh, as I wait for this render, I'm flipping through this magazine, and there's an interview with Carpenter from when he did the the fog. And somebody, and the person who interviews, ask him, "What would you? Was there a project you'd love to do?" And he says, "The star, of my destination." And I was like, "Man, for, since wow. like 1980 until 2000, he's been thinking about making this movie." And so oh. I just want to, you know. That's that's my next Kickstarter. I'm just going to raise money for John <laughs> for Carpenter. Him. Yeah, <laughs> to make stars my destination. He needs. Well, we try to, 
John needs our help. <laughs> He's a, or we get him to like remake Caddyshack. Like, okay, we're gonna go way, way against type. Like, yeah, you know, like, let's convince him. You can do comedy. Let's go. Yeah, let's go broad comedy. You've never get... done it before, okay, John. Let's You've time never to done try. It before we're gonna get, you know, go out the, with a laugh. That's what <laughs> <laughs> we get. Um, Fluffy to be the main character. Uh, uh, never mind. As I, long sorry. as he, as long as he does the score, that that's exactly you know, get back together with Howarth and you know get the the band back together. Cundy's still out there, you know. Everyone, let's be friends again and do one more. But um, you know, Blake, we've been we've we're going deep into the night uh, for this recording here, and thank you for uh, for hanging hanging in there with us. Appreciate it. Oh yeah. Tell everybody again where to go for. Uh, scored to death the kickstarter yes that's uh that's the official title um yeah scored to death it's on kickstarter we're trying to raise money for a documentary uh about horror film music the definitive documentary on horror film music we've already have a great cast kind of signed on but who else participates and how many more people participate and if the and if the movie will even get made all are dependent on the support of uh, horror movie fans and film music fans. And uh, so the, the title of the movie is Scored to Death, The Dark Art of Scary Movie Music. But uh, if you just search Scored to Death on Kickstarter, I'm sure it'll come up. You can also join, uh, can also come over to scoredtodeath.com. All the information's there. Social media at Scored to Death. Um, there's kind of the trailer sizzle video for it. So you you get to see some of the stuff we've already shot. I've already, I've also put up a a little video of Charlie Clouser talking about uh, his main theme from Saw called Hello Zep. Nice. Explaining how that was created. So uh, I've got a great cast already hoping to add more to it. And uh, obviously it's a, it's a subject I've kind of dedicated the last 10 years of my life kind of uh, exploring. So uh, I'm really excited to get the chance to do it as a movie and kind of explore it in a way that I have never had a chance to do it before. So, and of course, check out the, the tier rewards. Um, like I said, we have that limited edition album that we're putting together for it, which is going to be awesome. I've already heard some of the tracks that are being done for it and they sound great. So um, any support you can give, whether it's financial or just spreading the word and letting other people know that it exists is much appreciated. Absolutely. You, you know, you, you like what you heard here, please support the, the uh, Kickstarter and also pick up the books while you're at it too, which uh, you can get scored to death.com, right? You can get them scored to death.com from me directly, but they're also on Amazon and from other book retailers. It's scored to death uh, conversations with some of our greatest composers. And scored to death two more conversations with some of our greatest composers, and it's a collection of thirty interviews between the two, uh, ranging from all the major franchises from Halloween, Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the Thirteenth, Hellraiser, all the way through to things like the original Japanese Ring movie and Audition and wow. Dario Argento's movies. All those, so many scores, so many great scores, including Silver Bullet, Jay Chadwick. Oh, yeah. One in-depth interview in-depth <laughs> interview with jay chataway about silver bullet and maniac because those are two of my favorite scores so yeah yeah the great collection of interviews from some very talented people yeah well that's that's great uh so everybody you know chip in for all of those things and um you know and you're still doing the podcast too or is, is that are you between episodes I, uh, I've been doing a music related podcast called score to death radio at a, uh, a network uh, at a podcasting network called uh, cinematic sound radio network. And I've been doing score to death radio and uh, it's a little bit of me playing music and it kind of introducing them. I just did a five part ex- like intense uh, informative series about the music of goblin, uh, the Italian progressive rock band that scored a lot of Dario Argento's movies and uh, many other Italian movies. And uh, this month for Halloween, I'm exploring uh, the music of the post scream late 1990s slasher uh, craze. Whoa. And, uh, All right. And I have a great guest, uh, a great film and film music journalist named Rachel Reeves joins me to uh, listen to many of the scores, uh, many themes from, 
the late nineties and uh, talk about the movies and the music. Nice. Very cool. Very cool. We'll have to, we'll have to plug that and check that out. Uh, thank you again for, for coming on. We, uh, we're halfway through our Shocktober at Reconcinimation. We've got one more big one. If anybody has been following the show, they'll know it's Halloween five. We're all excited about it. <laughs> one of my favorites, everyone's favorite Halloween movie. Oh boy. Revenge of Oof. Michael Myers coming up next. So, uh, yeah. I, I wrote the liner notes for the uh, re- the reissue of that soundtrack. Did you? Holy shit! Nice. All right, we're we're uh, in royal presence here. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so stay tuned for that. And uh, a quick thank you to uh, our friend Ek Wimmer for the theme music, and check out his podcast Laser Graves. Our friend Curtis Moore for the poster, as usual. And that's going to wrap up. Christine Blake, thank you for joining us. I'm sure we're going to we're going to have you back here. We'll we'll all be paying attention to what's going on with Kickstarter and trying to uh, get the word spread about that. Thanks, guys. You know, always a good time. You always always bring me on to talk about some of my favorite things. So it's always a pleasure. So glad you're here, man. Great having you. All right, guys. Well, we'll see you next time on Reconcinimation. Take care. Bye now.